In the year 1785, just nine years after the Revolutionary War, America exported five bags of cotton to England. The cotton never made it. Collectors at the port seized it because they said cotton could never have been produced in the United States. Only eight years after that, in 1793, America produced five million pounds of cotton and no one anywhere doubted it had been made in America. In those eight years, the cotton crop in America had exploded from a mere possibility to one of the greatest industries in the country. Cotton had paid the debts and offered a new start to thousands of struggling farmers, and it had made the already wealthy even wealthier. What had happened in those few years to create such a change? Eli Whitney had happened, and with him, the invention of the cotton gin. Independence from Great Britain meant far more to the American colonies than just political freedom. It also meant economic freedom. Before the Revolution, American farmers and manufacturers were restricted by heavy taxes and requirements imposed on them by the British government. Although America was rich in natural resources, and rich too in genius and inventiveness, it still imported many of its goods and materials. Americans hoped the war would end all that. They were filled with hope that liberty would also mean prosperity. But a decade later, that prosperity still seemed elusive. There were only four million people in the newly formed country, scattered thinly over 13 different states. Vast acres of rich agricultural land waited to be farmed. Endless towering forests waited to be turned into lumber. Within the earth, huge quantities of ore and minerals waited to be mined and the many mills and factories that could make America self-reliant and profitable had yet to be built. There simply weren't enough people to do it all. What was needed was yet another revolution, a revolution in tools, machinery, and production methods that would allow America to reach its enormous potential. These were the times and the problems into which Eli Whitney was born. He was 11 years old when the War of Independence was won, as many little boys, he was filled with great regret at having been born too late to share the excitement and triumph of the battles for independence. But instead, he would lead a new and different revolution, an industrial revolution that would eventually make America not only the freest, but the wealthiest country on earth. Whitney was born on December 8, 1765, in the town of Westboro, Massachusetts. His father was a farmer, but more important to Eli than the acreage his father tilled and harvested was the workshop behind the family home. There, Mr. Whitney made and repaired farm equipment and furniture for his home. And there, little Eli, like most future inventors, spent his time tinkering with tools and disassembling and reassembling every gadget he could get his hands on. Eli attended school, but he wasn't a very good student and was filled with doubts about his own intelligence and capabilities. His reading was so poor that when he was ten, he was in a class with eight-year-olds. What he did excel at was math, or what was then called ciphering. He was also good at whittling. He would sit with a penknife and carve wood for hours, a habit that stayed with him until he was an adult. When he whittled, Eli Whitney could think. When he was only five, Eli's mother became ill and took to her bed. She stayed in that bed, an invalid, until she died seven years later. Eli was then twelve, and the oldest of four children. For two years, until his father remarried, he bore most of the burden of the household, bringing up his sister and two brothers, preparing meals, and keeping the house clean, while his father labored on the farm. His sister later said that he was a good parent and always cheerful, more importantly, he learned responsibility far earlier than most children do. His sister described him as having more general knowledge than men considered of the first standing in the country. In whatever free time he could find, Eli skipped over to the workshop so he could watch his father working with his tools. His father was a big man to Eli, both literally and figuratively. He weighed 300 pounds, and Eli respected him more than anyone else on earth particularly the way he could repair and make almost anything they needed. Eli learned as he watched his father, and even as a child, he was known for his mechanical skills. Once, when his father was out of town, Eli surprised him by making a fiddle from wood he'd pilfered from the lumber pile. It looked and played as well as a professional's.
During the years of the Revolutionary War, life was hard on the farm, as it was on farms and in houses all across America. Supplies grew scarce, and the money to buy them grew even scarcer. When Eli's father complained about how hard it was to find enough nails for his work and how expensive they were, Eli came up with an idea. He started spending his extra time at the forge in town, studying how nails were made. He practiced with the iron rods until he could heat one just right, make a nail, and head and point it. When he finally could make twelve nails that met his approval, and the approval of the blacksmith, he persuaded his father to build a small forge in his workshop. Then he began making nails at home. The business was so profitable that Eli, at the age of only fourteen, had to hire an assistant to help him. Eli Whitney, from the start, was as much a businessman as he was an inventor. His priority was never just to create, but to create, market, and make a profit. Years later, when he invented the cotton gin, making a profit off it would prove a long and disappointing struggle. By the time Eli reached the age of 19, he surprised his family by announcing his intention to go to college. No one in the Whitney family had ever attended college, and what's more, no one in the Whitney family had the money for a college education. Once again, Whitney had a plan. He would take a temporary job as a teacher until he'd saved enough to go to school. Mr. Whitney approved of Eli's plan. He'd always seen special aptitude and skill in his son, even if he hadn't fared well at the local schools. Eli's stepmother was of a different mind altogether. She had always assumed, like his father had, that Eli would spend his life as a farmer, and farmers certainly had no need of a college education. But Eli made it clear to both of them. He wanted more than the plain, obscure life that a country farm offered. He wanted to make a name for himself. Eli found a job teaching in the daytime, and then he spent every night studying so he could pass his college entrance exams. Finally, after four years of work, he had both the money and the knowledge he needed. When he enrolled at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, there was only one other person in the class who was older than he was. In the early 1780s, when Eli Whitney started college, Almost every boy in Massachusetts who went to pursue his education chose Harvard University in their own home state. But Whitney wanted to broaden his world and stretch his horizons. He chose Yale because it was farther from home, not closer. Then he faced another important decision. Now that he was there, what was he going to study? His first choice was law, not from any particular dedication to justice, but because, as he wrote home to his parents, most of the rich people in America seemed to be lawyers. But he found he was also drawn to science, or as it was then called, natural philosophy. The science department at Yale was still in its infancy in those days, but it did have a museum with an air pump and an electric machine, and in its library was a copy of Principia, the groundbreaking work of English scientist Isaac Newton. In the classrooms, Whitney could hear the lectures of the president of Yale, Ezra Stiles, a man well known for his experience in science, as well as in many other professions. Whitney took it all in, just as he took in the culture and society of New Haven itself. By the time he graduated, four years later, at the age of almost 28, he had become an educated and urbane gentleman. But he still had no idea what his career would be. President Stiles obtained him a teaching job that fell through. And finally, Whitney was forced to take a tutoring job with a family in South Carolina. As he headed for New York to board the brigantine Mary one day in 1792, Eli Whitney was a young man who thought his prospects in life suddenly looked very gloomy. He was 28, he had no profession, and he was heading south for a post as nothing more than a servant for a rich man. He was so depressed that he wrote home, The climate of South Carolina is unhealthy, and perhaps I shall lose my health and perhaps my life. He had no way of knowing that he would never reach South Carolina. He would never be a servant to a rich man, and on his travels, he would meet a person who would change the course of his entire life. As arranged by some friends, Whitney was traveling that day with a group of people headed by a well-known society lady named Catherine Green. The green name was almost as famous in post-revolutionary America as the name of Washington. For Nathaniel Green, Catherine's deceased husband, had once been quartermaster to Washington and was one of the most beloved generals of the war.
Green had now been dead for two years. Catherine, his widow, had been dividing her time between her summer home in Newport, Rhode Island, and her winter home in Mulberry Grove, Georgia. Mulberry Grove, where she was headed now, was a large plantation the state had awarded her husband for his military achievements. It was soon to be the scene of a great achievement in another field of human endeavor. Catherine Green was a pretty young woman with sparkling eyes that matched a sparkling personality. Among her traveling companions that day were her five children and a man named Phineas Miller, manager of Catherine's estate. The plan was for Whitney to meet them in New York and travel south with them aboard the Mary. The journey to New York did nothing to lift Whitney's already sagging spirits. The boat carrying him across Long Island Sound ran aground, forcing him to cover the remaining six miles in a hired wagon. An hour after he reached the city, he ran into an old friend, shook hands, and then realized the man was completely broken out in smallpox. By the time he reached the Green Party, Whitney was exhausted and discouraged. Catherine Green had been married to a military man. She was a woman who knew how to take charge of a situation. Immediately, she whisked Whitney off to a doctor for a smallpox inoculation. As a result, when he did come down with the illness, he had a very mild case. Still, it kept the travelers in New York for two weeks beyond the departure date. After the boat arrived in Savannah, Whitney spent a day exploring the city, his first day in the south of America. It was autumn, and up north the air was crisp and cool, but here the muggy heat made him tired even just to move. While in Savannah, Whitney received a telegram from South Carolina informing him there had been a misunderstanding about his post as a tutor. His pay was only going to be half of what he expected it to be. Now he was even more discouraged. It was then that Catherine Green extended him a very gracious invitation. Why not visit her plantation, rest for a week, and then continue on to South Carolina? Whitney, who was growing less anxious by the moment to begin his tutoring position, readily agreed. Neither he nor Catherine could have guessed that this one-week visit would stretch seven months as they tried to solve one of the biggest economic problems facing the American South. Whitney had only been at Mulberry Grove a few weeks when Catherine Green realized what a skilled mechanic he was. The first proof was when she was planning to send a broken watch to England for repairs, and Eli offered to do it instead. The watch was returned the same day in perfect running order. Another day, Mrs. Green was bent over her embroidery and was frustrated over how the frame kept pulling at her threads. He made her a new frame after spending a week finding just the right wood and tools. When neighbors visited the plantation and remarked on the beautiful workmanship of the frame, Mrs. Green was always quick to give Whitney credit and to state her belief that he could make anything. She was Eli Whitney's first and most devoted fan always encouraging him to give up law and to work with his hands, always predicting he'd achieve great things and even telling her friends that someday he would be the man to rescue the South from its financial woes. If it's true that the secret of success is to find a need and fill it, then Eli Whitney was in the exact right place at the exact right time. In recent years in England, two men named Hargreaves and Arkwright had invented a wondrous device that spun cloth, and now cloth-spinning mills were springing up all over the country. These mills needed cotton, all the cotton that Georgia and any other southern state could grow. Georgia could grow cotton, and so could most of the other southern states. The challenge was in what to do with it after it was grown. When the pods or bowls of cotton were ready in middle or late summer, they were filled with numerous seeds. Before the cotton could be dried, gathered into bales, and sent to market, those seeds had to be removed. For 2,000 years, humankind had been growing cotton, and for 2,000 years, it had been trying to find a quick way to seed it. In Whitney's days, there were only two methods being used, removing the seeds by hand, a long, laborious process that produced only a pound a day, or passing the cotton through two wooden rollers run by a crank, a process that was almost as time-consuming as hand removal. There were thousands of acres in Georgia and the Carolinas where farmers could grow cotton and didn't, because the time it took to seed it left them little or no profit. Catherine Green was convinced Whitney could make a machine, an engine as she called it, to remove the cotton seeds and make the South rich. 
When she pointed out that such an invention would also make the inventor rich, Whitney became even more interested. There was no need to worry about what had happened with Hargreaves and Arkwright spinning machines. When those were first invented, angry mobs stormed the factories and destroyed the machines because they'd put so many people out of work. But the way Mrs. Green and Eli Whitney saw the cotton engine, it would create more work. It not only wouldn't replace human hands, but it would create an agricultural boom that would require many new hands. With the financial backing and support of Catherine Green and her manager, Phineas Miller, Eli Whitney set to work. It took Whitney only six months to come up with his first model of a cotton engine, or cotton gin as it was called for short. Like most great ideas, it was incredibly simple in design. The gin consisted mostly of a toothed cylinder that revolved against an iron cage holding the cotton balls. The fiber of the cotton could pass onto and through the cylinder, but the seeds, which were larger, could not. The only glitch that bothered Whitney was that much of the fiber stuck to the teeth of the cylinder and had to be periodically removed. That was solved by adding a brush that revolved in the opposite direction and automatically cleaned the lint from the cylinder as it turned. Then the cotton was ready to be baled and sold. The gin could be run by a water wheel, horsepower, or even by hand. Whitney's first test showed that what had formerly taken an hour to seed by hand now took one minute by machine. Word began to spread through the neighborhood that in a barn at the Green Plantation was an amazing new machine. A 50-pound bag of cotton would disappear into the barn and come out seeded in no time at all. The whispers began to spread that a young man named Eli Whitney was about to make the South wealthy. Whitney did want to make the South wealthy, but he saw no harm in becoming wealthy at the same time himself. He and Phineas Miller had decided they would obtain a patent on the gin and set up factories where they would seed all the cotton being produced with their own machines. The company would be called Miller and Whitney. It was Miller who had invested all the initial money in the project. That summer, Whitney headed to Philadelphia, which was then the nation's capital, to see if he could obtain a patent. He filled out the required forms, made the necessary sketches, and sent his application to the government for approval. He submitted his application in June of 1793. The government would not get around to approving it until March of 1794. While Whitney waited, he built his first workshop in New Haven, Connecticut, where he could find good tools, materials, and workers. Then he constructed the first six cotton gins. And also, while he waited, word of his incredible machine began to spread, and so did the secret of its design. Unwilling to wait until Whitney could produce enough machines to serve everyone, planters all over the South began to build their own cotton gins. For the next eight years, Eli Whitney spent a good portion of his time in the courts of America, testifying in 60 different lawsuits he'd brought against others who were making and using his machine. Whitney and Miller built more gins, borrowed more money, and Mrs. Green even mortgaged Mulberry Grove to pay the cost of the endless trials. Still, Whitney lost almost every suit. Finally, he won a large sum of money and an injunction against the pirating of his cotton gin for the life of the patent. But the money barely paid for the lawyer's fees, and the patent, as was standard in the early 1800s, was for only 14 years. After that, the cotton gin belonged to everyone. Whitney went on to make many other inventions, most of them labor-saving tools and production methods that contributed greatly to the growth of industry in America. But he never again took out a patent on his inventions. Instead, he sold the rights and royalties to his work outright, rather than endure the same slow and expensive trials that had so blighted his first and favorite invention. As Catherine Green had predicted, Eli Whitney's cotton gin quickly put an end to the financial problems of the South. It put an end to empty fields, to debts, and to dependence. It also, as it so happened, put an end to Southern efforts to emancipate the slaves. Before the cotton gin, there were as many opponents to slavery below the Mason-Dixon line as there were above. After the cotton gin, almost no Southerner dared to speak out against slavery. For now, there was a huge agricultural industry that relied heavily on the cheap labor of slaves, who still had to pick the cotton by hand.
cotton growers were becoming richer and richer with their new burgeoning crop. Men who once owned three slaves now owned 50. Men who owned 50 now owned 200. And as slavery increased in the South, sentiments against it grew stronger and stronger in the North. In a very real sense, Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin played a major role in the Civil War that divided the country 60 years later. There is no evidence that Whitney was ever concerned about the rise in slavery brought on by his ingenious machine. It was an issue he never wrote or spoke about, though many others of his time did. Instead, he seemed primarily focused on how to protect his patent and save his profits. And he was focused on something else, too, his next big idea. Whitney's new idea was one that had its roots way back in his childhood during the Revolutionary War, when he heard the talk about muskets and how they were made. At the time, every musket and every piece of a musket was made by hand. Not only was the process slow, but it meant that the parts of the guns weren't interchangeable. If a certain piece broke, it couldn't easily be replaced. It had to be fashioned to fit the individual musket. It always seemed to Whitney that this was an inefficient and impractical method of production. In 1798, when he was 33 years old, and the problems of the cotton gin were mostly behind him, he decided to take on the challenge of finding a new way to manufacture muskets for America's growing army. And in doing so, he created a system that later became the backbone of American industry, mass production. It was Whitney's idea that he could create patterns for each piece of the musket and, using the patterns, produce identical standard parts in rapid succession. Then the parts could be assembled later into guns that were all alike. Whitney sent his idea off to the American government with the promise that he could produce 10,000 muskets in two years' time. It was an astounding idea. With current production methods, there weren't enough gunsmiths to produce that many muskets in a lifetime. But Whitney had no intention of using gunsmiths. He planned instead to use ordinary mechanics trained in the use of his patterns. Encouraged by his reputation with the cotton gin, and supported by such visionaries as Thomas Jefferson, the government agreed to take a chance on Whitney and gave him the contract he'd asked for. He then launched a period of intensive, exhausting work that was plagued by obstacles from the beginning. To start his new enterprise, Whitney first had to build a factory. He chose a site at Mill Rock on the Mill River near New Haven. To use the power of the river, he first had to rebuild a dam and move it to higher water. But a severe winter delayed his plans, and the dam was completed far later than he'd hoped. Then he ordered gun barrels, the only part of the gun he wasn't going to manufacture himself. His first contractor accepted the challenge of 10,000 gun barrels, then got cold feet and backed out. Whitney began a long search for another contractor, finally found one, and then began a search for the source of iron ore he would need. All of this preparatory work took up the entire first year of his contract. Whitney was forced to seek advances from the government again and again. When the barrels and the iron finally arrived, the workshop had been completed, and Whitney began the process of training men to do work they'd never seen or heard of before. In one section of the shop, a man laid a small shape into a pattern and began to file without having to measure. The pattern told him when the measurements were right. In another section, a man fastened a steel plate with holes bored into it over a piece of iron and began to drill. The pattern told him exactly where the holes should go. No measuring, no stopping, and every piece was drilled exactly alike. While the men worked, there would often be visitors, important visitors, a manufacturer from Germany or an officer from France. They were interested in buying muskets, but when they saw this strange new procedure, it was clear to them that Mr. Whitney had no idea how to make a proper musket. While all this went on, Whitney dashed back and forth from the musket shop to the shop two miles away where his cotton gins were being manufactured. He worked day and night, month after month, without any rest. During this time, he often talked about how much he'd like to marry and raise a family, but he felt his demanding work and his unstable finances didn't allow it. There may have been another reason he held back, too. In 1796, when Whitney was 31 years old, 
he received the startling news that his partner, Phineas Miller, had married Catherine Green. Whitney's letters of the time reflect a jealousy and resentment that have given rise to theories that he had secretly been in love with Catherine himself. It's easy to believe, since he didn't begin his own search for a wife until the year Catherine died. By the end of two years, the shop by the river was beginning to produce muskets, but instead of the 10,000 he had promised the government, Whitney had just a few samples to show. Finally, he received a letter from Washington, home of the nation's new capital, beckoning him to come and explain why his contract shouldn't be canceled. Whitney described to the War Department how it had taken him two years just to set up his plant. He took with him boxes of parts and assembled a musket before their very eyes, then invited an officer to do the same. With demonstration and persuasive argument, Whitney convinced them his idea was still a worthy investment, and the government agreed to renew the contract. The terms remained unchanged, 10,000 muskets at $13.40 each. Happy, but feeling the weight of the pressures on him, Whitney returned to the shop on Mill River. In the end, it took Eli Whitney not two, but eight years to deliver his promised muskets. He was paid $134,000, minus advances, bringing the grand total to $2,400.06 for eight years of grueling labor. Around this time, he also received the news that his petition to have his patent on the cotton gin extended had been denied. In spite of these setbacks, from here on in, Eli Whitney began to prosper. He sold more and more of his muskets and expanded his factory, until soon he was running a full armory. He also built stone houses for all his workmen. The states of the South granted him payments for what they called benefits received from the cotton gin. South Carolina paid him $50,000, and payments came too from North Carolina and Tennessee. Georgia, which had benefited most, offered nothing. By then, it hardly mattered. After 30 years of struggle, he was finally a wealthy man. Through all his years of single-minded work, Whitney had taken almost no time for recreation and rest, and he himself admitted that he always felt he was missing a great deal in life. With his financial and creative goals met at the age of 57, he finally decided to make up for what he'd lost. Whitney married Henrietta Edwards, the daughter of a Connecticut aristocrat and the granddaughter of Jonathan Edwards, a world-famous philosopher and one of the finest minds to come out of colonial America. The couple had three girls and one boy, also named Eli. Whitney turned the supervision of his factories over to his nephew so he could enjoy his new belated family. He did, however, like to come on tours, carrying along his son Eli and explaining to him how muskets were made. But only three years after his marriage, Whitney began to suffer a series of illnesses, no doubt aggravated by his many years of intense work and stress. In the last years of his life, he was seldom well. He finally died on January 8, 1825, at the age of 65. He had been married only eight years, and had seen none of his four children ever reach adolescence. There is no doubt that Eli Whitney, driven by his own brilliance and his longing to make a name and a fortune, sacrificed much to bring his ideas to life. It's hard to know which of his two greatest inventions had the most influence on history, the cotton gin or his system of mass production. The cotton gin had a profound effect on agriculture, the economy of the South, the institution of slavery, and the future of the United States. Mass production of uniform parts had a major effect on industry and was later adopted by such business giants as Henry Ford. That America became the leading industrial nation in the world is an achievement that can be traced directly back to the ideas of Eli Whitney and others like him. There were other American inventors before him who showed as much genius, Ben Franklin being the most notable, but Eli Whitney was the first to approach invention as a business and to make an industry of his creativeness. After him, there would be many for whom invention would be a profession, such as Thomas Edison. But Eli Whitney was among the first to exemplify that combination of inventiveness and ambition, the desire to contribute and to also profit that became so much a part of the American character.